Um, so next we'll move on to uh, Kevin Kosar. And Kevin Kosar is the Governance Project Director uh, and Senior Fellow with the R Street Institute. And he oversees three separate research programs that aim respectively to strengthen Congress and uh, actually modernize the Postal Service and rationalize federal and state alcoholic uh, beverage policies. He also uh, worked previously for the Congressional Research Service for 11 years and, and was the lead analyst on postal issues. So he's got a lot of insight and expertise and he's going to really talk about the process and politics of how, you know, where is post reform? How do we get it done and, and, and what that entails? So Kevin, please. Thanks. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, as you heard, I worked at CRS for uh, over a decade doing postal work there. And uh, I had the opportunity to stick my nose into just about every aspect of postal operations, whether it was the minutia of that's constituent driven, like people writing into congressional staff and saying, you know, how high do I have to make the post on my mailbox at the curbside in order to meet USPS regs? Because right now they're not delivering. Um, to bigger policy issues, the bazillion dollar postal uh, pension and the retiree health benefit funds issues, I was involved in that too. Uh, I was around for the 2006 Postal Accountability Enhancement Act. Um, so I've seen a few things and um, much of what I gleaned during that time beyond the postal policy was uh, on the postal politics. And I developed a appreciation for just how complex and how difficult they are. And so when we talk about the legislation we have now, well, all legislation is gonna be the product of politics. It doesn't get handed down from geniuses on high. It's not a perfectly rational process. There's bargaining all around. And that bargaining is um, driven by various groups, various individuals with various ideas and various wants and needs. And so I wanna comment a little bit about um, this sort of political stuff that produces postal legislation and often sinks postal legislation. So, gosh, where to begin? First, um, one aspect of postal politics is, well, you might call it nostalgia. Um, there are a lot of folks in this country, particularly older ones, who hold in their hearts the image of the smiling letter carrier bringing letters written by friends and family, and the image of the charming post office uh, with the American flag flying outside. I grew up in such a town, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. I still remember the name of my mail carrier. His name was Bill, and he was always really nice to me when I was a kid. Um, many of us have that sort of stuff, so we have a soft spot for the Postal Service. I mean, it's the one government agency that touches Americans every day. Letter carrier shows up. So when you talk about changing stuff, closing post offices, reducing days of delivery, you tap into those emotions and people get very, very defensive. Another facet is localism. Towns and cities tend to take an attitude that the local post office and mail processing plant is theirs. This is our post office. You frequently hear if you read constituent mail or you see people showing up on the local news. And it's understandable that they feel that way, but of course this runs directly counter to the Postal Service's statutory requirement and authority. Unlike many other government agencies, it has a remarkable degree of control over where it locates its facilities. And it's supposed to do that with an aim towards creating a postal delivery network that is rational and efficient. So there's that tension. Um, there's also a public attitude split of sorts. Some folks kind of view it, Postal Service as a great agency, and others kind of look at it as a kind of hapless dinosaur. Um, I mean, when most Americans are polled, they're generally positive about the Postal Service Yet there's always existed this significant portion of the public that does not like it. Um, and we've seen that sort of thing embodied in pop culture images like Cliff Clavin on Cheers and Newman on Seinfeld. Um, they were like the Postal Service personified uh, in a bad way. Um, people deride it as a monopoly, a government monopoly, which they think is even worse. So that feeling is out there, and that's part of the postal politics. There's also an old and young divide 
that's really starting to erupt. I mean, when I grew up as a kid, I hand wrote letters, mailed them off. Um, my mother in Ohio, who no longer uses a computer, um, when I went to send her pictures to my kids, I print them out of my printer, and I stick them in an envelope, and I mail them off to her. Yet I have um, a bunch of nieces and nephews who, when they applied to college, they did it online. When they want to contact me, you know, I get texts. Um, they don't care about the mail. They have no regular use of it. Um, they don't, you know, see why you can't just have a drone or Uber or somebody else bring you the stuff that you want, because that's what they know. They didn't grow up with me playing around on typewriters and handwriting stuff. A really huge one for postal politics, a really huge political divide is city versus rural. It's something that's heavily cemented by the fact that we have a Senate with two persons from each state, no matter what the population. This divide in postal politics has been there from the start. Um, cities' high densities uh, make them profitable place for the Postal Service to operate. Uh, you got a lot of people in a small amount of places, you're walking to apartment building, you're stuffing a whole bunch of mailboxes in one spot, you're not loping down the street large distances or having to drive a car you know, from one farm to another. Remote rural areas tend to be money losers for the Postal Service. Um, flat shipping rates. It's nice to be able to drop a letter in the mail and not have to think about how far it travels. You play a fat, flat rate for the letter, flat rate for priority mail. Well, guess what? There's got to be a subsidization involved because sending something a flat rate 3,000 miles or 2,000 miles away to my sister in Arizona is going to cost a little bit more than sending something two blocks to, say, the D.C. government when I have to pay my taxes. Um, so you get this city-rural rift about who's paying for the cost of business. And funny enough, the, the city-rural city, the city rural rift even is uh, embodied in the fact that the letter carriers, there are two unions, a rural letter carriers union and NALC that's more focused on cities. Another thing that bedevils getting really good postal legislation passed is confusion over what the Postal Service is. And some of this is, is, involves the nostalgia aspect. A lot of folks glom to the notion that the Postal Service is a medium mm -hmm. for communication. But that's mostly not true because when I think of communication, it involves a two-way conversation. Uh, and the great bulk of what the Postal Service delivers today, as we got a hint of from this little stack over here, is stuff sent. Uh, it's stuff broadcast to people. Um, and so what is the Postal Service today to us? Is it really a means of communication to keep people in touch with each other? Or is it kind of a vehicle for not-for-profits, for-profits, etc., to kind of broadcast out their message and try to get customers? I mean, I, it's astonishing. Um, the quantity of mail that is actually person-to-person -person letters is, what was it, three, four, maybe five percent of the total mail volume. Um, it's, it's, it's something quite small, uh, and that, that has consequences. And I think it's going to have even more consequences as we go forward, as people get more and more used to not getting person-to-person -person correspondence in the mail. Political divides are endemic. Um, mailers, consumers, their needs are not always the same. Big mailers, small mailers, their needs aren't always the same. Uh, not for profits, um, they are subsidized. Um, on the one hand, they provide wonderful public services, raising money to feed hungry kids, money for medical research, etc. but somebody's got to pay for that. There's no free lunch. Um, so postal politics, in short, is hyper-pluralistic. Everybody wants something. Very few folks want to give anything. And so it's so hard to do serious postal reform. We had the 71 Postal Reform Act, that was dramatic. We didn't have any other. We had the 2006, but that was incrementalist. And now we have this current legislation, which is all even more incrementalist. So on the one hand, I find myself a little emotionally divided. I think that the folks on oversight and government reform have toiled and toiled and toiled and really worked hard and blessed them for their blood, sweat, and tears. 
but when I look at what was produced, I don't see a plan for saving the Postal Service in the 21st century. It's kind of, you know, we're putting some patchwork on and staggering forward. And I don't see a way that the legislation is going to get them out of the $15 billion in debt that the Postal Service currently carries. Um, it's not going to help them significantly reduce the $120 billion in unfunded liabilities they have. It doesn't really grapple with the fact that the future of the Postal Service, revenue-wise, we kind of should assume that it's going to be pretty flat. And if your per capita employee costs are going to rise, which they tend to do, that's a tough business model to make work. And so with that, I will close, and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Kevin.